chapter 134. Graham Shooter waited in his room until he felt the vibrations of his mother's footsteps tromping upstairs before he put his sneakers on. Connie would bathe now. It was a ritual that would last an hour. When she finished, she would read for another hour and then go to bed. After 18 years of marriage to a police officer, she didn't wait up anymore. He wouldn't be back until tomorrow morning. Graham knew she wasn't worried. She only worried about the knock. Connie feared that more than anything. It was the middle of the night, patrolman on the doorstep, knock. Graham shivered. Losing his father was the worst thing he could think of happening. It was bad enough he wasn't around much this week. He couldn't imagine losing him forever. Detective Calvin David Shooter Sr. worked every day since arriving in Lancaster, leaving the unpacking to Graham, his mother, and his brother. Coco was a jerk most of the time, but they tried to have patience. He just got out of 90 days of drug rehabilitation. He hadn't sworn off drinking or smoking pot, but at least he was off the harder drugs. Coco knew if he got caught with any drug at all, it was back to rehab for 180 days. So far, that threat kept him sober. Graham's deafness wasn't a handicap in his house. The TV's had closed caption, the doorbell and the phone had lights to signal him, and his family knew sign language. Coco wouldn't sign anymore. Graham hated that, but it didn't matter. It made him fight to become adept at lip reading. He was tired of Coco being able to badmouth him in front of his hearing friends. The one thing his brother did for him, and to be mean, gave him the chance to go to public school. Graham liked the deaf school well enough, but it was his social life he had in mind. He intended to go to Gallaudet University and become a teacher. In the meantime, Graham didn't want to be transported a million miles away each day to go to school. He was tired of being segregated from his neighbors. He couldn't hear, but he wasn't retarded. He wanted to make friends with kids who didn't live far away. School wouldn't be the center of his social circle anymore. He knew it would be hard. There would be problems with films without captions and teachers who taught with their backs to the class. Some of the kids might tease him because his voice was off key, but Graham didn't care. He would find acceptance. He was through having friendships over the TTY, his droid, or the internet. Graham put on his waterproof Patriots jacket, peeked out of his bedroom door to make sure his mom wasn't lurking around, pocketed his droid, and hopped out of his window. He sucked in the clean, wet country air and smiled as he pulled the screen back down. He left it open a crack for his return. He felt the thunder boom. The lightning filled him with glee. I love the rain, Graham thought. His mother would tan his behind if she caught him out in it, but it was worth the risk. His backside was no stranger to the paddle. He wasn't bad or anything, and he didn't get beaten often, but there were times he earned his spankings. Graham grinned, like tonight. He reached down and patted the grass, thanking it for being so close. He chose the only downstairs bedroom when his parents gave him first pick for this reason. He loved to sneak out and wander around. The lightning didn't scare him, and neither did the dark. Sometimes he walked for miles in the middle of the night. He learned his way around most of Worcester. Why should he go through all the trouble of climbing up and down trees to sneak out if he didn't have to? There weren't any close enough to this house to do that anyway, not like their old house. Coco was livid, since he liked sneaking out too, but that was just too bad for him. So, Graham thought, taking the long way around his yard, I'm a spoiled brat. Sue me. Graham crossed Mary Circle heading east. He wasn't a hundred yards into the woods before he was soaked, but he was in his glory. The summer rain was warm. His destination for the evening was Lancaster High School. It was on a hill overlooking the town. It promised a dynamite view of the area and the storm. 
His mother didn't want him to go to a crime scene with his dad tonight. Fine. He would watch the lights from up there. If he could find a way, he would get on the roof. He debated going to the cliffs, but decided against it. It was too risky in the dark until he became familiar with them. Graham hoped to be able to do that with Mrs. Sturgis's son and their friends. She told him out of all the boys he could meet in Lancaster, they were the best. She raved about the Bakis, some boy named Matt, her sons, Sandy and Ian, and the Ramirez brothers. Graham was dying to meet them all and go to the farm. His mother said no regarding that so far. It was unpacking to do. He agreed with her, but too easy. He didn't know unpacking would take all week. He figured it would be worth the wait. He would have met with Susan again on Thursday, but she canceled to go to that poor kid's funeral. They rescheduled for Monday. Susan promised to bring her sons with her. Graham looked forward to that. As he neared the top of a small hill overlooking the section of streets Susan called Rainbow West, Red Road, Orange Street, Brown Road, and Green Drive, a familiar scent hit his nose. Graham frowned, shaking his auburn hair out. That stench is the worst, he thought. He decided to find the source of the reek regardless of the consequences. He inhaled deeply through his mouth and climbed the rest of the way up the hill. He came over the crest, dripping wet. The source of the scent was close. Up here, it was ten times as pungent. He scrunched up his nose. He looked around, raided the view, but elected to go on. There were too many trees in the way to see much. He stepped through a mess of blown-down branches, feeling the force of the lightning exploding in the sky. He watched in awe. A few steps further... Graham found the source of the stench polluting the countryside. Oh, crap, J.T. Kerouac exclaimed. He slapped the blunt he and Keith were smoking out of his brother's hand. He grimaced, his braces glinting. Ow, Keith cried, the burning head landing on his wrist. He slapped it out. Careful, J.T., you burned me. J.T. lifted his brother off the log he was sitting on and spun him around. Keith gasped when he saw Graham. He didn't know him, but he felt he was in deep trouble just the same. Keith knew sneaking out was colossally stupid, but he couldn't resist. Getting stoned in a thunderstorm was the coolest. He was already grounded forever, so what did it matter? Keith hadn't worried about getting caught until now. Who are you? J.T. asked. His parents ignored his pot smoking, but would wreck him if he got caught. Graham walked over and looked closely at the taller boy's lips. The rain blurred his vision. He motioned for J.T. to repeat what he said. J.T. rolled his hazel eyes. What are you, deaf? he asked. Yes, Graham replied. I'm Graham. This voice sounds funny, Keith remarked, relaxing a bit. He looked for the blunt and sighed when he found it. It was floating in a puddle. That's because he can't hear, ma'am, J.T. remarked, introducing him and his brother. He spoke very slowly. Graham shook hands with them. Just talk regular, he nodded. I can read your lips. You don't have to talk slow. We thought you were a narc, Keith said. A narc? Graham asked, cocking his head. A cop or something, J.T. corrected. That's not me, Graham said. Now he knew why they looked so worried. That's my dad. J.T. and Keith gasped. Graham laughed. Don't worry. My older brother smokes pot. I don't, but I won't tell on you. Thank God, Keith cried. I'm in enough crap. A woman's scream pierced the darkness. They heard it over the thunder. The brothers looked at each other. J.T. hollered, Come on! Sprinting toward Mary Circle. Keith moved to follow. His brother's long legs were sure to leave him behind if he wasn't quick. Graham grabbed his arm. He asked what was wrong. A woman screamed, Keith exclaimed. He started to run. He pulled Graham to come with him. That way? he asked, nervously pointing toward his house. Oh, God, it can't be the knock. That way, Keith replied, pointing further down. Let's go. 
They ran down the hill together. They could barely see JT up ahead. Graham took the lead. The sudden rush of adrenaline made Keith very lightheaded. He held on to the back of Graham's Patriots raincoat. They caught up to JT quickly, who was vomiting in the bushes. Keith thought it was the stink all around them that made his brother sick. It smelled like a skunk squished in the middle of the road on a hot summer day. Graham's expression told Keith otherwise. His face turned white. Keith followed his gaze to the O'Connor's front door. I'm stoned, Keith whispered, his dinner threatening to come up. Terry Greer was on the O'Connor's front porch, his eyes gouged out, his slashed throat wagging in the wind. He stabbed Brandy O'Connor, an obese woman in her mid-thirties, repeatedly with a kitchen knife. She was against the door jam, trying to scream again, but Terry severed her vocal cords. Two additional boys held her husband, Charles, Todd's father, on the sidewalk. Every time he struggled to move, the smaller boy punched him in the balls. Keith and Graham watched in horror as Terry rammed the knife into Brandy's stomach. She fell on the porch, her eyes wide with confusion, and died. Charles wailed. Shut up, Terry screamed. Did you know Hiram Milliken's been molesting your son for years? Your wife did. Did you know the farmer murdered Todd tonight? Terry kicked him in the face before they ran away, leaving Charles alive. Keith watched, frozen in terror, as the dead kids dashed right past them. He took one look at Terry's destroyed face and puked in the bushes next to his brother. Graham held his nose. The stench of death nearly overwhelmed him. JT wiped his mouth. He stared at Charles, shocked, as he crawled up the steps toward his dead wife. Come on, JT cried, yanking at Graham and Keith. We have to follow them. Are you crazy? Keith cried, slapping his hand away. He spat to the side and asked, Did you see his face? Dead face, Graham cried. Do you want to let them get away? J.T. snapped, shaking his brother. What if they get into Rainbow West, man? What about Mom? We have to, Graham insisted, terror making him shake, so we can tell the police where they are. My dad's on call tonight in town somewhere. It's probably because of them. They ran after the zombies. Jesus, man, Keith cried, tears threatening. He glanced back at the O'Connor's residence. Look at all the blood. Graham hoped that as they followed the killers toward Wicked Avenue, they weren't making the biggest mistake of their young lives.